Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Denise Ratzlaff. I uh, served as the 40th Youth Development Educator here in Fond du Lac for quite a few years. Uh, so welcome this afternoon. We're going to talk about 4-H, which I've entitled our program An American Idea because it started here in the United States and it's spread around the world. I've actually been involved with 4-H for over 40 years. First, I was a 4-H member here in Fond du Lac County. My mom and dad had a dairy farm south of Fond du Lac and my brothers and I were members. Then, I became a 40th Youth Development Educator in Wood County in central Wisconsin then in Waukesha County, and then here in Fond du Lac for the last 20 years, and I retired about a year ago. I also was a 4-H parent. Our children were in 4-H. As a 4-H member, I was involved with what are called projects. First of all, is anybody in here a former 4-H member? Oh, quite a few. So you'll have some memories that are brought back, I hope. Um, for those of you who weren't in 4-H, we were involved in what are called projects, which are learning experiences. So as a youth, I was in projects like dairy and knitting, um, home furnishings. When I was in home furnishings, I bought an old um, cedar chest and refinished it, and I still have it in my home today. I was involved in the cooking project and the sewing project. Uh, there were about 20 girls that were in the sewing project, and our leader was Jocelyn Ryan from the Brownsville area. Some of you may know her. Anybody know who Jocelyn Ryan was? She was a leader who since has passed away. But we'd meet at the Grange Hall. There'd be about 20 tables, I posted along the wall. They're set up in the Grange Hall, and there'd be a girl at each of the tables with her helping us learn how to measure and cut and sew and stitch. So I uh, really learned a lot through those experiences. I also was a junior leader here in Fond du Lac County, which is a group of teenagers from all over the county who are 4 H members who get together and plan activities and events. I also was a camp counselor. So we planned camp for younger 4-H members um, and organized the, the camp activities. And it actually was, was because of camp that I met my husband. Um, he had a friend who was a camp counselor and I met his friend and then met him. And my husband is here today in the back row. So we've been married 39 years. So it was a good thing that that happened. Um, as parents, we have two children who are also 4-H members. Our son was involved in the model rocketry project a long time, and he actually went to space camp, which is in Huntsville, Alabama, where you learn about the international space uh, program and the history of flight in the United States, so that was a really good opportunity for him. Our daughter was involved in photography and art projects in 4-H, and she had a chance to travel to Mexico for a, and live in Mexico for a month as part of the 4-H international exchange <coughs> program. Both of our children were involved in adventure project, which is learning about the outdoors and camping. Now growing up, we lived in a dairy farm, we never went camping. So when the 4-H club that our kids were in said, let's go camping, uh, we ended up buying a tent and went camping for the weekend and learned how to do outdoor tent camping. And it, our kids loved it so much that we ended up camping for many years after that with our kids. So that was a real positive experience about how as a family, we worked together in 4-H to learn a new skill and then do it for many years. So that's kind of what happened in, in my life with 4-H, but we're here today to find out how did all of this come to be, all these opportunities that I just mentioned, how did they start and, and what brought them about? So Fond du Lac County has a 4-H program as does every county in the United States of America. Every county in the United States has 4-H. So it's a huge program, and each county has a mission that's similar. Fond du Lac County 4-H mission is here at the top, enriching youth, families, and communities. Notice that it's not just about the kids. It's about involving your families and involving the youth in the communities so that the, that the young people are giving back, learning citizenship skills, and leadership skills. So how did this come to be? In the late 1800s, there was a gentleman named, named Liberty Hyde Bailey. He lived in New York State, and he said there are just too many rural schools that are not doing enough for our rural youth. We really need to step it up. And so he began to organize clubs, and they studied nature, because that was one thing that they weren't doing in school, and he felt that rural kids really need to learn a lot about the outdoors and the environment. 
At about the same time, in 1902, there's a gentleman named Albert Graham, who was a school superintendent in the state of Ohio. And he also felt that there were deficiencies for rural kids learning in their schools. And he felt they really need to learn how to do agriculture production much better. So he began clubs outside of the school hours and encouraged kids to come back to these clubs or stay after school and actually test various experiments related to agriculture production. At the same time, the Ohio State Agricultural Experiment Station was trying to convince farmers of new ways of producing and increasing their yields. But farmers weren't necessarily willing to try new things. So think about it. Today, when we have Instagram, how many of you were the first to jump on the Instagram craze? Nobody raised their hand. But if you're maybe 18 or 16, you just think it's something natural to do. So what they did at the uh, experiment station was instead try to work with young people and get them involved and teach them the new techniques. So um, Graham found out that the Ohio State Experiment Station was doing this, so he collaborated with them across the state of Ohio with uh, new seeds and new varieties and encouraging kids to plant those new varieties. <coughs> In 1898, so this is all about the same time, in the state of Illinois, there was a gentleman named Will Otwell, and he said the same thing that these others had said, that there really is not enough production in agriculture, and we should be getting better yields. So he began a contest, and the contest was to try to invite boys to get higher yields of corn, and he would pay $1 a $1 premium for whoever yielded the best corn. So what really worked here was a combination of things. It was the competition, or the premium payment, and the clubs that really began what we know today as 4-H. It wasn't yet called 4-H. It actually started, the, the year that they considered 4-H to actually start was 1902. So that would have been the time that Albert Graham was involved. But all these things were happening about the same time. So here's a picture of the corn contest. And this is from the early 1900s. Notice the boys are all riding horses. And it's called the Otwell Farmer Boys because Otwell was the man from Illinois who had started this competition. And they went to the Louisiana Expo and took their corn there and had this huge, huge pile of corn so people could visually see the wonderful yields that they had gotten off their crops. So what do you think this did for the, the men who were farming when they saw this corn yield? They went, aha, I've got to give this a try. So they began to listen and find out what these young boys were doing to increase their yield. So this really wasn't meant so much as a way for young boys to be involved in something as much as it was a way to get farmers to increase their yield, and they did it by working through their children. So this became so popular, they saw that this, these yields were increasing so greatly, well, we gotta try it other places. So some of the next states to do it were the states here in the Midwest, Iowa, Nebraska, Wisconsin, and then a couple of states in the South, Louisiana and Mississippi. So here, so in addition to the, um, the corn testing, they began germination testing. So they would give kids packets of seeds and try to get them to increase their germination yields and then keep records on um, what was the best conditions for get, getting things to germinate. They also did but, um, bad cock butter fat tests, which is a test that's done with milk, the higher the butter fat content, the more your milk will sell for. So they were doing tests on how do we increase the butter fat in their cow's production. But about the same time, the girls were not involved in any of this, so people began to say, well, let's start girls' clubs. So at this time, they were called boys' clubs and girls' clubs. So the boys would do the gardening or the crop production, and the girls would do things like uh, baking and canning and sewing and basket basketry clubs. After they were involved in these clubs for a while, the students would get a pin, so it's like an achievement pin, and the pin had three clovers on it, which stood, or three clovers on the pin, three-leaf clover, and the, on the clovers were written the H's or the words, 
head, heart, hands. Because that was the beginning of what would eventually become the 4-H pledge. One of the gentlemen who was involved in this group at this time was a man named William Smith. He actually was a school superintendent. The USDA paid him one dollar a year to start some of these clubs. He wasn't so much concerned about the pay because he already had the job of being the school superintendent. But the reason they paid him the dollar because, was because then his work would be connected to the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, and make it official. And he could then do mailing that had the official government logo on it or mail uh, stamp, and the mail was franked, so he did not have to pay separate postage to get this literature out to farm families. In 1903, the United States Department of Agriculture thought, oh, there's some other problem we have, and that was the boll weevil in Louisiana. And again, they tried to convince farmers to use new ways to fight the boll weevil, but they wouldn't try it. So they began the same type of um, effort in Louisiana, having kids find out ways to fight the boll weevil and keep records on it. And again, it was because of the work of the young people that the farmers began to make changes in their crop production to save their, their crop. So here we are at the beginning of the 1900s, a new, a new um, century has begun, and you can see the, uh, the first 4-H clover, and the youth were expected to keep records, because if you're just going to try a new technique, but not record uh, dates or temperature or volumes or what you did to it, how are you going to learn from that? So one of the requirements was if you were going to be in these competitions, you need to keep records on on um, what you did, what, um, what dates were, how much what you paid for things, and so forth. And today in 4-H, we still have record books. So here we are 100 and plus years later, and we still have the expectation that youth in the 4-H program are keeping records on their work. So this first 4-H clover was designed in the early 1900s. The one on the right, the green one, is actually the 4-H clover that we have today. How many of you recognize this? Even if you weren't in 4-H, you might recognize this, kind of like you recognize the Pepsi logo, even if you don't drink Pepsi. <laughs> so this 4-H this, uh, clover is actually, actually trademarked by the U.S. Congress. In other words, you cannot alter the color, the shape, the size of it in any way. So it's actually a trademark that cannot be used by another organization. In 1912, in the state of Wisconsin, we began the extension service. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because 4-H is now a part of the extension service. When the extension service started, it was 4-H had not yet existed in Wisconsin. But in 1912, the first county extension offices were started. Now here in Fond du Lac, there's a county extension office located on the UW Fond du Lac campus. In 1912, the people who served as county extension agents were hired through your land-grant college. There's one land-grant college in every state in the United States. Does anyone know where it is in Wisconsin? Madison. Somebody said Madison. That's correct. So the land-grant colleges was land that was actually given about the time of Abraham Lincoln for each state to have education. So it, the land-grant college in Wisconsin is Madison. So these extension services began out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the reason they're called extension is because the people who came to live and work right here in your county are extended employees of the state of Wisconsin. So they, the extension agents, when they started in 1912, were people who actually lived right in the communities that they were working in, as they still are today. And at that time, their sole purpose was to help farmers with their productivity. The first counties to have extension services in Wisconsin, oops, what did I do? Looking for the red button here. The first counties were Oneida, Eau Claire, and Barron <coughs> County. And again, the focus was on how do we educate um, mostly farmers to increase their production. Then in 1914, Congress passed what is called the Smith 
Lieber Act. This was an agreement between the federal government and the state government that they would help fund the extension services. Over time, the counties also became involved in funding this. So ext the extension service was called cooperative extension service. That's because it was a cooperative arrangement between the federal, the state, and the county governments, which each of them helped providing funding, as well as helping to determine um, some of the programming and how things would be operated. So then in 1914, when the Smith-Lieber Act passed, we actually had the first 4-H club in the state of Wisconsin, which was in Walworth County. And we had the first statewide corn contest in the state of Wisconsin, which was held at the state fair in 1915. So it was about a decade after other states had been doing that. Then in 1917, uh, with World War II happening, it really became an emphasis that the clubs had to think about, I said World War II, World War I <laughs> <laughs> happening. Um, they really need to think about how do we increase food production? How, and so the 4-H clubs began to focus on gardening, meat production, canning, and not wasting anything. How do we use everything? Um, because the country was at war. Then in 1919, because these clubs were um, increasing in numbers across the, uh, across the various states, there was a decision made that they should have a, have a uniform structure. And some of the uniform structure that was suggested is that there be at least a minimum of five members to make up a club, and that they work on a similar project. So you have a club, it might be a club that you would both belong it would be a canning club and you might also belong to another club that was a sewing club so you might belong to actually several clubs now today in the state of wisconsin they're no longer organized like that instead you belong to a club like the south byron 4-h or the campus Ford 4-h or the ripon 4-h there are about 25 clubs in Fond du Lac county so you belong to a club which is part of a community and in that club, you then enroll or sign up for a project like basketry or cooking and so forth. However, in other states in the United States, it's still that you join a club like a horse 4-H club or a canning 4-H club. So depending upon where you are in the country, it is organized slightly differently today. But all of the clubs needed to have a local leader, which would be a, an adult who would help guide the young people and the young people would elect their own officers. So the 4-H members would serve as presidents, vice presidents, secretaries, treasurer, parliamentarian, and they set up their own agendas and run their own meetings. Another requirement is that they develop a plan for the year. So the 4-H members had to think about what do I intend to learn and do individually, as what will we also do as a group? And that included not just learning about their projects, but how will I give back to the community that's supporting me? And that's really an important part of the 4-H program still today. Other things that needed to happen was that young people needed to have an annual exhibit. In other words, they had to share what they learned with somebody else. They could do that at a club meeting. Many of them did it at a county fair or they could do it at some other community event, but the expectation was that there was, a, that there was an exhibit of some kind that was a public exhibit. There was also an annual achievement day, so all the members who met a certain level of minimum expectations were recognized for the work and the achievement that they had accomplished. At about the same time, project literature was developed. So project literature is material that the young people could get and that they could use to help them learn about their project. Now today, you could just go to the internet or you know how many other sources to get information. But at that time, none of those um, electronic sources were available, encyclopedias weren't real common, so this project literature was very popular for helping young people learn about their project. Then private funding began to be sought so that the program could increase. And a national committee was formed so that Funds could be developed to help support the 4-H program. In the 1920s, it was after World War I, the government decided that they needed to allocate more toward restoration of um, after the war, war efforts. So therefore, they decided to put less money into the uh, 
club structure that was being formed across the nation. So there was a lot of fundraising that started to help support the 4-H program. The people who had run the 4-H program were paid staff. And as the program grew, we needed more and more people. So many, many people were recruited to be volunteers. They were parents, they were community leaders, they were neighbors of kids. So people began, began to be volunteers in 4-H in the early 1920s. In 1923, 1,600 youth attended the first National Club Congress in Chicago. Now think about that. These people came from all over the United States in 1923. What an adventure it would be if you were from you know, Wyoming or Texas to travel to Chicago, to this huge city. And the reason this National Club Congress was held was you were the top winner in your state in your project. So you were the top person in the corn project or the top person in the canning project or the top person in the sewing project. So the top people in each of these projects were invited to come to this club congress in Chicago. It was a recognition ceremony, but also some time to see the sights of Chicago and also some time to learn about citizenship and leadership. Today, we still have National 4-H Club Congress, but now it's held in Atlanta and it's no longer an award for the top person in a project. But it is, um, here in Fond du Lac County, young people need to apply and be interviewed and then selected to represent our county in order to attend. And it has now become just a leadership and service opportunity for young people. And we only can send uh, five people a year, so it's really kind of an elite group of kids who participate. In 1924, it's finally the time when the clubs began to be called 4-H. Instead of being called boys clubs or girls clubs, in 1924, 4-H became the official name. And the reason they came up with this name, or had a name, was when you have a name, you feel like you belong to something. And so it created this sense of uh, togetherness and uniformity with kids from across the country. This is also when the camp program started. Now when I say camp, I'm not thinking about going outdoors and and hiking and being in a tent, but they call it a camp program that actually went to Washington, D.C. And it was a program, again, to encourage young people to be leaders. So this started in 1927. Today, instead of a camp program, it's called, it's a program called Citizenship Washington Focus. It's a nine-day program, and people from, young 4-H members from all over the country participate and they learn how a bill becomes a law, and they actually take the role of um, senators and representatives, and they learn the role of how a bill becomes a law and actually practice it. Then they visit many historical sites while they're, while they're there. And again, this is an opportunity where young people apply and are interviewed in order to participate in this today. <coughs> so what started as a camping program in 1927 still exists, but in a very different format. Also in the 1920s is when the 4-H Pledge was adopted. So the 4-H Pledge is, I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. So it's not all about pledging to yourself, but to the community that you are part of. At this time, there was also a national 4-H motto. The national 4-H motto was, not our bit, but our best. I'm gonna repeat that, because I think it's kinda cute. Not our bit, but our best. Since then, the national 4-H motto has changed, some of you may know it, and it's to make the best better. To make the best better. Also in the late 1920s, because with volunteers were being recruited, they began forming county leader organizations. These were adults who volunteered to help with the 4-H program, and they formed their own associations so that they could help the young people. In the, by the 1930s, there were a million 4-H members across the United States. Foreign exchange programs began to start happening, 
And there was a national 4-H magazine um, at that time that no longer exists. This photo, if, I don't know if you can read it here, it says, I did it again, <laughs> Fond du Lac County Band. So this was a band that was um, playing, and there's quite a few kids in it in the 1930s. The very first 4-H music festival was held in five counties in the state of Wisconsin, and it had over 5,000 kids participating in that music festival. Also in the 1930s, there were orchestras. So this was an orchestra from Fond du Lac County. This photo happens to be from 1933 from the Fond du Lac County Fair. Now actually the Fond du Lac County Fair started in 1852, long before this. Now the fair, Fond du Lac County Fair and the 4-H are two separate entities. Sometimes people think they're one and the same. But the Fond du Lac County Fair is its own organization which organizes the fair, which includes the uh, midway and the bands and the food and the rides. But if, how many of you have ever been to the Fond du Lac County Fair? Mm -hmm. Quite a few, right, most of you. I mean, you know, on one end are some buildings with, with uh, cattle and crops and flowers and arts and so forth. Most of those entries come from 4-H kids. Sometimes they also come from other youth organizations, but most are 4-H members. So we work, or the Extension Office and the 4-H Office works with the fair to collaborate on getting those entries that kids have made to the fair. <coughs> this happens to be the fair from 1933. One of the things that's changed over the years in regards to the fair is, when I was a youth, and I would say take chocolate chip cookies to the fair, so would 50 other girls, or boys, and you would drop off your entry. And then the judge would look at your entry and maybe taste it and give it a premium or a placing. Blue, first, red, second, white, third, pink, fourth. Give it a placing. And you'd come back the next day and you'd find out, oh, I got a red. But you don't really know why. So one of the things that changed over the years was called face-to-face -face judging. Now instead of I going in and dropping off my cookies and them being cared to compared to 50 other people, I go in and I sit down with the judge across the table and he or she will ask me, what recipe did I use? How did I measure the ingredients? Did I ever try to change the ingredients to experiment with it? Um, how did I know they weren't overbaked? How long did you bake them? So depending upon how old you are and how, my, how many years you've been in a project, they're gonna ask you tougher questions. So it's not about just how did the project turn out, but how much did you know about it? How much did you learn from it? Was there trial and error so that you got better at that project? So then the ribbons are based only not, not just on the item that you've made, but on your knowledge of having produced that. And the same would be true of if you're making, building a rocket or whatever entry you have at the fair. Another fair photo, this one is from the Folly County Fair in 1933. And uh, again, this was uh, after World War, sometime after World War I. At one time, the goal was to produce a lot. But after World War I and the Depression, the goal was not so much to produce a lot, but how do we produce economically? So the focus changed a little bit. Now you can see by looking at this pi these pic <laughs> sorry. These pictures here, these, um, how old do you think these people might be that are kneeling down with these sheep? Any guesses? Teens, Teens or a little bit older? Um, at one time, you could be up to age 21 and be a 4-H member. Mm -hmm. Today, you can be as young as five to be a 4-H member, and you can stay in 4-H until one year after high school, so until about 19. So today it's from age five to 19, at this time, you didn't start 4-H until you were 9 or 10, and then you could stay until you were 21. So that has changed a little bit. <clears throat> now we're up to World War II, and we had Victory Gardens. Anyone familiar with Victory Gardens? Mm -hmm. Ah, a couple people. So Victory Gardens were a way to increase production. The idea was that if you grew good quality food and good amounts, 
you could feed your family, which would then help the fighting men and women overseas. So this was your way at home to help the American effort in World War II. By this time, there were about a million and a half members. Um, the other things that were done to help the war effort was young people would, part of their service project, they would collect scrap metal and aluminum, and they would then use that money to purchase war bonds. Or they would collect milkweed pots. Did anyone of you ever do that? A couple of you. And what did you do with them? I don't quite remember. I know we tried to bring them someplace, and they told us they were used for uh, life vests. That's exactly right. They were used to fill the life jackets of, of sailors. In Grant County here in Wisconsin, they collected 19,000 sacks of milkweed pods. So that's a tremendous amount from one county. So those again were used for part of the war effort. So the, the goals at this time were not so much about, you know, what can I learn from a project, but how do I give back to this war effort that our country is part of? How do I develop responsibility as a citizen in my community? At the same time that this was happening, there were two women whose last name was Upham. Their parents passed away, and they wanted to memorialize their parents. So what they did was they gave 300 acres of land to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and stipulated that it be used for youth outdoor education. That land has now become, or quite a few years ago, became what is called Upham Woods, named after the family. And Upham Woods is the state 4-H camp. So many counties send their 4-H kids to camp at Upham Woods, which is located near Wisconsin Dells, and then the land was donated during about the time of World War II. 1940s on the left is an exhibit about forestry, and you maybe can't read this word right here. Can anybody read that one? Mm -hmm. Eden, it says. So this display was probably set up by a club at the fair from a club that was around the Eden area. And the boy on the right is holding sugar beets. So he even had a display of sugar beets. That's a big, big beet there. <clears throat> 1944, this is a picture of people who were serving as uh, members of the Fonda County 4-H Leader Council. So as people began to volunteer, they started doing training opportunities for volunteers. In 1944, the records indicate that 70 different counties in the state of Wisconsin held over 500 leader training sessions that reached over 16,000 volunteers in that year. So we already had a lot of people who were volunteering at that time. So what are some of the things that happened after the war? There was a slight change in programming. The programming focused on how do we cooperate with each other at play and at work. Because here we just had this world war between countries, there was conflict, so many people were killed. How do we turn our environments and our, our way of living around? So the focus began on this cooperation. It also looked at how do you choose a career rather than just a job, do a job. How do we have better living environments? How do we conserve our natural resources and protect our environment? How do we make America a healthier country so that we can live longer and do a better job at raising our families and going to work and maintaining our farms and homes? And realizing that we are citizens of the world. After World War II, people began to realize that this world is bigger than the community we live in. It's really about the whole world. The National 4-H Foundation was created. The National 4-H Center actually is located in Washington, D.C. So when kids go to the National 4-H Congress, they stay at the National 4-H Center. There also began to be more programs that were designed for international work, and scholarships were provided for extension workers. So people who were employed to work at the extension offices who worked with the 4-H program started to receive more training because more funds were available to improve their education. Today, the National 4-H Foundation still exists and supports many of the programming efforts of 4-H members. <coughs> the state of Wisconsin also has a state 4-H Foundation, 
Some of you maybe have heard about the um, meat auction at the state fair. Many of the funds that are raised from that meat auction go to the State 4-H Foundation. They have another, other fundraisers during the year. But those funds help pr promote um, or provide support for young people involved in 4-H in state level activities. And here in Fond du Lac County, we have a 4-H endowment fund that was started about 50 years ago. And again, fundraisers are held by 4-H members or leaders throughout the year to help uh, build that fund to help support the 4-H activities. Then in the 1950s, the slogan, learning by doing, was added. So think about what does that mean, learning by doing. It's not somebody telling you how to sew. It's not telling somebody telling you how to build a model rocket, but you are actually doing it. It's all about hands-on. And that's the focus of 4-H is how do kids learn by actually doing something, whether it's community service or leadership in their club or a project. At about this time, 57% of the youth were about um, farm youth, which meant that the other 43% were what? City. City, City or, or maybe they lived in the country but not on a farm. So a common misconception about 4-H is that it only is for farm kids and it only reaches farm kids. It certainly began with farm youth, and today there are many farm youth still involved in it, but it has grown much beyond that. So that the Reaching out to the cities actually began in the 1950s. New projects began to be offered that hadn't been offered before. So tractor maintenance, because 50 years before that, there wasn't even a tractor. So now we have tractor maintenance and health and automotive repair. Um, I talked about the, we also had a national 4-H agents association form. So when I was a 4-H educator here in Fond du Lac County, I belonged to the national 4-H association, and they would hold, hold conferences during the year where you could go and learn what other states were doing, what activities they had, and then incorporate them back in your own state. Also, the National 4-H Conference for Young People was started. The National 4-H Conference is held every April, so about this time of the year, in Washington, D.C., and only 10 youth from each state are allowed to participate. And what they do is they go and they talk about what are the important issues that youth are facing today or the important issues that our country is facing today. Those issues are then prioritized, and that helps determine the focus for the upcoming year, or actually probably several years off by the time they get it planned. So the young people from throughout the country are really determining the focus of how we will um, program in the local club. In 1950, we had the very first Fond du Lac County 4-H volunteer leader, leader recognized for 20 years of service. So this was the first person who had been volunteered for 20 years. And this woman happened to be from Ripon. Achievement programs were held in the 1950s. The one on the left is a picture of kids being recognized for their achievement. And the picture on the right is a dairy display, probably one of those public displays that young people had to do as part of their project. This shows in 1957 the Canning Club. Notice it's all girls. And on the right is an electricity club. Notice it's all boys. So they were not integrated yet. This picture also from 1957 shows a group of junior leaders, which are teenagers, who are planning their activities for the year. And the picture on the right are record books from young people. And uh, as I said earlier, record books are still used today. Young people keep track of what did I do? What did I learn? What would I do differently if I was going to do this uh, project again? And how will I apply what I learned to next year's activities or apply to other aspects of my life? So it's not just about what is helping me do in 4-H, but how will I apply this to a family situation? How do I apply this to, to my school life? The IFI program started. IFI stands for International Farm Youth Exchange. And this girl happened to be from Netherlands. But the exchange programs are very popular um, still today. You can either host people from another country at your home, or you can travel to another country. We have 4 Hers from our county who have gone to Mexico. In fact, our daughter went for a month. Uh, Australia. Europe, South America, and Japan. 
So we have usually young people every year that are either hosting someone or who are traveling someplace. One year my husband and I hosted a woman from Japan who was the chaperone with the kids who were coming from Japan. It was a great opportunity for us to learn about Japanese culture during those two weeks. Uh, this happens to be a picture of Norris Berg, who was a dairy leader. He was from the South Byron area. He was being recognized for his years of being a leader. So not only are we recognizing members for their involvement, we're recognizing and thanking volunteers for their involvement. Again, this is uh, achievement um, pencils were handed out as the award for members who had completed their first year in the 4-H. Then we're in the, again, in the 60s. Here, 4-H desegregates, which means that at one time, it was, it was segregated. So you did not have clubs that were, uh, when it was the boys' club, it wasn't a club with black and white children. It was just white kids or just black kids. So now, in 1960s, just like the 60s desegregated and the civil rights movement we're all aware of in the 60s, the same thing happened to the 4-H programs. They desegregated and the programs became integrated. And then the 4-H pledge was modified in 1973. At the end of the 4-H pledge, it says, I pledge my head to clear things with my, my club, I gotta think about this, my club, my community, my country, and my world. At one time, it was just my club, my community, and my country. So in 1973, the words, the words and my world were added to the end of the 4-H pledge to really emphasize that what we're doing as members affects the whole world. We're a global organization. There was an emphasis on being a good citizen and what does it mean to be a citizen. 4-H program expanded to over 40 countries around the world and it also began to move to the inner cities. So we would have um, projects, especially in public housing areas. So in like downtown Chicago, in public housing, or in downtown Washington, D.C., where there were low-income youth or minority youth, the 4-H program began to reach them. Today, 4-H is one of the largest youth programs in the entire world. Beyond this membership <coughs> in, this, in the United States, there are 7 million people who are 4-H members outside of the United States. It's found in about 70 different countries, and as you can see, the list there is just about everywhere in the world. Each of these programs in these nations operate independently. So it's not like the U.S. has control of what they do in you know, Spain or what they do in South Africa. Each one is their own independent organization. Many of them are not called 4-H. They might be called 4-S or 4-C because it's in their own native language. So they would not have had hard hands help like we do. They might have a different words, so they might be called something slightly different, like 4C or 4S. So one of the things that I was involved in in 2011 was a program in Tanzania. As I said earlier, was, um, the United States started 4-H. One of the countries who benefited because of what they saw happening in the United States was Finland. Finland had 4-H for a long time, and after they had had 4-H a long time, they said, we want to pay it forward. We want to help another country develop their pro program, just like the United States helped us develop our program. So they formed a partnership with Tanzania, and for 20 years, they provided training and information and support to Tanzania. Then in 2011, they said, we really need to expand this. So this photograph is of staff people who are 4-H staff people from 13 different African nations who came together in Tanzania. Then staff people from Finland and myself and four other people from the United States met with these 13 different countries and we helped them talk, or we worked with them and talked about how do we recruit volunteers, how do we train volunteers, how do we recognize volunteers? Because volunteering in Africa is not a commonplace thing. And we realize in order to make your program grow, volunteers are an essential component to make it happen. For instance, in Fond du Lac County, when I was working there, we had over 600 4-H members. There's no way I could alone organize activities for 600 4-H members. So volunteering is important. So this program was really sponsored by Finland for Tanzania 
involving people from the United States in doing this training. While we were in Tanzania, we got to visit many of the 4-H clubs. So this is a picture of a young girl who was in the sewing project. The other projects that they had were the same type of projects that were the, what was started in the United States. They were projects raising birds, or pigs, or rabbits, or gardening. So the agriculture really is the, the beginning of their 4-H program here, but it also was the start of their 4-H program in Tanzania. One really unique project that they had that we do not have here was graveling. They would take hunks of stones and take another stone and bang it until the first stone broke up into small pieces of stone so that they could use for gravel. So very, uh, not much technology, but it was interesting to see that project. So back in the 1960s, back to now, um, new projects again continued to be offered rocketry, because this was about the time of the, where the space program in the United States really exploded. So let's help kids learn about the space program and what does is, what is outer space mean? Veterinary science was added, and then a new project was added called self-determined. In other words, if you wanted to do something, but there was no project listing for it, you could create your own project for that particular year and develop a plan of what you were going to do. We also started the um, beautification project. Um, LBJ's wife, Lady Bird Johnson, was a really big component, or a, a pusher for that project. Just like we have first ladies in the White House now, they have pet projects that they are addressed. Well, at that time, Lady Bird Johnson was really big on beautification of the country, so it started this beautification and anti-littering program. Photography was added as a project. Um, dog obedience became a project. We have lots of kids in dog obedience yet today. And here in Wisconsin, 4-H started in the city of Milwaukee. <clears throat> and special interest groups were formed. Special interest groups were kids who got together just during the summertime for short-term programming. At this time, we also had um, television that transmitted 4-H programs. So you could turn to 4-H TV, it was called, and you could see a a program on emergency preparedness. Or you could turn on 4-H TV Science Club and, and watch as they did science experiments. So that was new as the TVs became more commonplace in people's homes. By 1970s, we had seven million members here in the United States, 600,000 volunteers across the country. And again, the, ener the uh, focus changed. Think about the energy crisis in the 70s. So what does 4-H do? They look at those national issues and begin to focus on how do we save energy? How do we recycle? How do we become more fit? Focusing on don't um, smoke, don't drink, don't do drugs. Um, and this was the very first time in the 1970s that a woman became a 4-H educator in the state of Wisconsin. And also programs were started to help youth who had disabilities access 4-H programs. Before, they really hadn't been very involved, but there was a push made about how do, we, how do we have young people who have disabilities be engaged and have all the same opportunities that other people had. Also in the 1970s, the 4-H programs began to cooperate with other organizations in the communities like the Boys and Girls Club. For instance, when I was working, we did joint programs with after-school programming between 4-H and the Boys and Girls Club. Their youth were invited to come to our summer camp. Their youth were in part invited to come to many of our events during the year. Also, 4-H was separated from the religious connection. At one time, 4-H celebrated um, uh, a special Sunday service every year, and it was called National 4-H Sunday. But because we didn't want to have people feeling that like they couldn't belong because they weren't affiliated with a particular religious background, that connection to religion was dropped. So there was no religious connection and that 4-H Sunday day was dropped. There was a big push on stepping up promotion and the focus was moved away from projects. So it's not like you're just learning about growing corn. You're not just, you're not just growing corn, but you are actually having an experience by really reflecting upon the projects that you're involved in. <coughs> There were also some changes at the national level. 
the national conference had been an award and now delegates were coming and I talked about that earlier. The National 4-H Center expanded and now houses over 600 people. They have programs for Washington Focus that are there all summer long, from the beginning of summer to the end of summer. People, um, 4-H members from all over the country are participating in those programs. In the 1980s, the focus changed to how do we help families be stronger families and stick together? How do we develop supportive friendships? Today, you hear a lot about bullying. And actually, these programs of supportive friendships were kind of the precursors, precursors to those anti-bullying programs that we have today. In the 1990s, um, youth actually became part of the leaderboards. I talked earlier about we have leader organizations, which are the adult volunteers. But now youth are being invited in the 1990s to serve on those leader boards. And here in Fond du Lac County, we have both youth and adults who serve on the boards. They have equal voice, equal vote. So it's a really great uh, leadership experience for young people to serve on those boards. So some of the le uh, leadership opportunities that have been added over the years are Space Camp, which I talked about earlier. Our son went to that. New Horizons is a program that started about five years ago. This is an opportunity for about 15 to 20 youth from our county, and every year they decide, what state will I travel to? So they decide as a group they're gonna go to, let's say Colorado this year. Then as a group they decide, will they fly? Will they take Amtrak? Will they rent a charter bus? How will they get there? They decide where they're gonna stay. While they're there, they're expected to do service projects in the local community. So they, do, they plan those. They are also going to do cultural activity in the community. So they're not gonna go to like a water park, but they're gonna go to museums or historical sites or cultural sites in the community that they're visiting, and they plan all those. Well, in order to do this, they have to raise a lot of money, so they also plan the fundraisers before they get there. And then while they're there, each night they spend time reflecting upon what did they do when they learned, what did they do when they learned during that day. American Spirit is a week-long experience um, to Boston, to Plymouth Rock, learning about early American history. The Wisconsin Youth Conference is a four-day conference in Madison every year for middle school 4-H members. And we also have many state competitions. So not only can young people compete at the local level, but at the state level. Today, Wisconsin 4-H includes STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. So emphasizing technology, an emphasis on multiculturalism, learning about other cultures. And today we have around 33,000 members in the state of Wisconsin. The projects, some of them are what we started 4-H with over 100 years ago. They include animal sciences, the arts, home and family, uh, mechanical sciences, natural, plants, and soil. So a lot of variety, lots to pick from. <clears throat> There are also many county and state activities. Creative Arts Day is music, drama, dancing, singing, photography, uh, <laughs> basketball tournament, learning days, foods and clothing reviews showing off what you've made and done. Um, shooting sport, I haven't talked about that. Young people can learn how to carefully and properly handle rifles and shotguns for hunting or um, pigeon shooting purposes. Um, and Cloverbud Day Camp is, a, is a, a one day camp for our youngest members. We also still have summer camp. And then young people as well as adults are part of committees that oversee many of these activities. This is the life skills model that 4-H uses to help young people think about what am I learning. So on this wheel, we see the, the pledges, head, heart, hands, and health. And each of them is associated with life skills that you are learning. So when a young person is in a project or a role, the leaders who are working with them will help them think about, how are you learning to keep records? How are you learning how to use critical thinking? How are you learning how to be more responsible? So this is a guide that the members and leaders will use to help young people realize that they are learning these skills in these projects or activities. And not only are they learning them here, but how will you apply them other aspects of your daily living. Thankfully, we have hundreds, literally over 200 volunteers at Fond du Lac County 4-H. 
It's phenomenal that the organization has that many volunteers. This is a picture from a couple of years ago of five volunteers who were recognized for their, um, their service several years ago. Do you recognize any of them? Sponsorship by business is also essential. Even though 4-H receives some funding through uh, the government, it also is sponsored by lots of business. I listed Kodak out there who no longer is in business, but they're one of the very first national sponsors. I've also listed a couple of state sponsors, but locally we have tons and tons of local businesses who support 4-H members who provide uh, resources or provide direct dollars or provide services. So between the volunteers giving their time and the businesses who sponsor 4-H, uh, we are very fortunate. So 4-H began as an American idea to prepare young people to be better people, to give back to their community. Today there are 45 million people, some of you raised your hand, who have been 4-H members. So it's touched lots of people here in the United States. In 2014, we celebrated the 100th year of 4-H here in the state of Wisconsin. And we had, one of the things that we did was we had a canoe trip that started at the beginning of the Wisconsin River, which is in north central Wisconsin. And they canoed the entire length of the Wisconsin River down to Prairie du Chien, where, where it empties into uh, the Mississippi River. So young people could come in, join that canoe trip any part along the way. So my daughter and I joined the last four days of the canoe trip. And I'm not a canoeer, so I'm glad we only went four days. <laughs> but we learned to canoe. We, we tent camped along the Wisconsin River as we went. Ended up in the canoeing down a little short distance on the Mississippi River until we got to a state park in Prairie du Chien and then celebrated. There were hundreds of people who participated in that hundredth year celebration. So 4-H four four is an integral part of the extension. We cannot operate without the extension service because we are part of that entity. And UW Extension is really committed to communities. And the next slide shows some of the programs that our local extension office here in Fond offers. Agriculture, leadership development, nutrition, um, the community garden that's over lo located across the road from the airport, there's a community garden that's run by UW Extension. Parenting programs, financial management programs, and the youth development programs. On the table as you go out, <coughs> I've left two brochures. One is about the Fond County 4 H program, and one is about the UW Extension offering. So if you are interested in more of, of that or think you could use either of them or your family members, be sure to pick up a brochure. That's it. Do I have any questions or comments about people's 4-H experience? Yes, in the back. Is there a building uh, participation for kids in the city? Any youth can join 4-H. Doesn't matter where they live. We have several 4-H clubs that meet right in the city of Fond du Lac. And we have 4-H clubs that meet in Ripon, Wapan, Campbellsport, Eden, uh, various town halls around Fond du Lac County. So 4-H is open to any youth, ages five, or yeah, ages five to 19. Boys or girls? Yes? Um, I belong to the John Club 4-H years ago. Uh -huh. I also worked at the 4-H office. Oh! From 1960 to 1965, I worked the Bureau of Mining and it was Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Harold Reinecke was the 4-H agent. Yeah. Mary, Mary Heisler, the, um, family living. Yeah. Yes. George Massey was a county agent. Mm -hmm. And Norm Jennings was, um, what's his name? He was farm management, maybe? Yeah. Farm yes. management? Yes. Yes. Some of the titles have changed over the years. Some of those people, Mary Heisler is still here living in the area. We were up in the old post office building on the second floor. Uh -huh. And I was willing to say they're great members. Great, thank you for sharing that. So a lot of what I've said today, you're familiar with. Yeah, yeah. it was nice, it was nice reminiscing. Great. Good morning, Denise, and some people are wondering how they get their grandchildren and children. 
Good question. So if you're going to look up uh, 4-H, you might want to look up UW Extension in the phone book. It, you know, the phone book is getting thinner every year. So, so sometimes it's easier to Google it if you're an internet user. Um, but you probably look up your UW Extension office or your 4-H office, and then they could direct you to a club that's in your community. Most people belong to a club that's in their community just for convenience. But if you lived in Ripon, you could belong to the club in Campbellsport if you wanted to for whatever reason. And you don't even have to belong to the club that's in your county. We actually have people who live in Sheboygan or Dodge County who belong to Fond du Lac County 4-H, and we have some Fond du Lac County residents who belong to outside simply because they have friends in those communities or relatives, or maybe they live in the county line and go to school in the other county. So there really are no boundaries as to which ones you would want to, to join. We do encourage people to maybe visit a club because some clubs only have 10 members, some clubs have 70 members. So your child or grandchild might fare better in one atmosphere or environment than another. Other, yes? Do all of the clubs, no, how would you decide if, okay, this club is into animals, or this club is into gardening, this club's into sewing? Good question, good question. Most of the clubs in Fond du Lac County have a variety of projects with a variety of leaders. Typically, they're parents or neighbors or friends or former 4-H members who are the leaders. So if you're gonna contact a club, you could say, well, my child is really interested in aerospace. Do you have any aerospace members or leaders? Uh, maybe if they do or don't, you might use that as one of the deciding factors if you're gonna join that club versus the next one. So you would just ask the leaders who are there. And the leaders are all volunteers, many of them um, for example, some of you may know Elsie Kutke. She is in the Oakfield area. She's been a leader for over 50 years. Nan Jean Kiso in the Wapant area. She's been a leader for over 50 years. So if many people, once they start on being a leader, they just love doing it and love interacting with the young people and have stayed leaders for, for a long time. Yes. like a youth conference of some kind for 4-H members? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I remember a lot of that. I remember the fair. Um, my parents were also in 4-H when I first started in mm -hmm. Fond County. So I have, you know, a box of 4-H stuff. Oh, nice souvenirs. Is there any place that is interested in mm -hmm. just the history of 4-H? I wonder if what this happens? historical society might be interested. Check with them. Okay. And when I was a 4-H member here in Fond du Lac County, we, we uh, camped also at Upper Woods. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful facility. Right on the... Uh, we also went to one called Camp Tulaki, but I don't know where that was located. I don't remember the name of it because it's kind of a clever name. <laughs> I'm not sure. Other comments or questions? Well, great. Thank you for attending today. Appreciate your